but uh, it seems that we have to go on. It's a very tight um, day. And uh, well, just um, to um, go to the next speaker, I would say that throughout his career, um, both uh, in his teaching and his practice, uh, Preston Scott Cohen um, has um, continuously approach like a, like a, 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 a serious um, undertaking which has to do with uh, basically problematizing architectural form. And I think that Scott has done so mostly through um, a almost autonomous uh, exploration uh, of uh, geometric transformations. I think that uh, in his presentation today, in his talk today, he's going to be presenting some work where these uh, geometric transformations are um, heavily informed by uh, natural light, and as he says, uh, by the reflection of natural light. So everyone um, knows Scott well, but uh, just uh, uh, in the formality requires that they say that Preston Scott Cohen is the Gerald M. McHugh Professor. He had the GSD and was chair of the um, architecture department, department from 2008 to 2013. His firm is recognized for the design of renowned cultural and educational institutions around the world, including the Sarmiento Performing Arts Center in Bogota, Colombia, the Taupman Wing at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, the Taiwan Museum of Art in Taiwan, China, the Amir Building of the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, and, and the Goldman Sachs Canopy in New York. Um, Scott has received numerous awards and honors and uh, is the author of Contested Symmetries, numerous theoretical essays, and a new book just out called Lightful. So please join me in welcoming um, Scott to to this um, symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Um, well, um, when I spoke to Charles about this, um, the moment he mentioned it to me, I was excited, particularly by the title, uh, Heliomorphism. Um, it could mean so many different ways of thinking about light. Uh, in my mind, uh, but I did understand that they would be primarily concerning matters of uh, environmental definitions of, of architecture in, in different contexts. Um, and I wanted to sort of circle in on how the, the matters to do with light that I've been preoccupied with have larger consequences. So it's a sort of circle of causality, if you will. Um, oh, okay. So what, hmm, there we go. Um, some people will know that I've had a preoccupation with this matter to do with causality outside, let's say, the domain of architecture, outside the discipline, examples and analogies that I have always held to be very significant. Um, in particular, this one for so long has been demonstrative of the way I think about the way something is necessarily transformed. And of course, in my mind, architecture is always a certain, involves a certain kind of transformation of conventions, of norms, of the behavior of buildings as they would otherwise play out prior to uh, the architectural uh, question bearing on them. Uh, so if a normal fish is symmetrical in our conventional view of uh, the, the human's understanding, the flatfish is a fascinating one because uh, it adapts in its environment by becoming distorted, which is, is very much like what I would like to imagine architecture could do, that it could do it ne necessarily. Um, and well, of course, we have other examples of distortion that are compelled by our own interests, and that would be, of course, this, the most extraordinary, I believe, drawing of Picasso, the turning of a head 180 degrees fully around, one of the rare cases in which he actually did that. Um, and so I, I'll show quickly these projects. This is only a brief talk of 15 minutes or 20 minutes, I think. Um, and I will just try to represent to you how I think the matter to do with light does introduce a, a kind of cause uh, to reconfigure institutions and architectural form. This is that, the, the project in Tel Aviv. I think a lot of people know about it, but I want to talk about it in this way uh, relative to the discussion we're having. The, the problem here, very simply, was that we are introducing a building 
too large for the footprint of the site. We're adding too much density. Um, and this, of course, is a wonderful and compelling problem for an architect to solve. Uh, the first was to drive the building into the ground as deeply as we possibly could. We actually had problems going very far, and we went to the absolute bottom. It ends up making it possible for half the building to be under. So we're entering a building in the middle, and you can see that ribbon window in the center uh, cutting all the way through, and this is the level we enter on. But the other problem is the shape of the site, which is so peculiar, and, and it's not quite a triangle, but in any case, close enough. And it turns out that this motivates this rotational kind of distortion. Finally, though, there is a problem to do with levels on the site. So many, seven different levels of subtle differentiation and access between them ramping around will eventually cause all of this to distort even further. Most interesting though, of all is the matter of bringing light, natural light, in, in a very particular way through the center and having it invade certain spaces in a very calculated way, very careful way. So what happens, you enter what seems to be a rather normative building in, and you don't know that you are on that mid-level, but approaching this source of light, natural light, discover that it's a plungingly deep building that you, yes, indeed, are in the middle of sectionally. And this is where you are. This is the level that you enter the building. And so you're, let's say, in the Guggenheim scenario, finding yourself halfway up, not, uh, neither at the top or the bottom with the choice you know, that you have there to begin in one or the other place, but rather a situation in which you're already immersed in this sequence of the, of the building, this orbital sequence. The light here does something else fundamental, though, which is to sort of make an egalitarian interior where all spaces have a relationship to this source of light, similar, a similar one, despite wherever they are in the section of the building. So we have managed with light to deal with a context of density and to thereby introduce a new idea about movement from the center up and down, but also confront another very difficult problem, which is to introduce very normative galleries, unlike the Guggenheims, which are spiraling, in the context of something that is driving light through reflectively in a complicated way, having to do with these hyperbolic paraboloidal surfaces that reflect it in very multiplicitous and complicated ways uh, and pull it through. Um, and these galleries, normatively orthogonal, remaining so, uh, being engaged with these surfaces along the de developers of these surfaces, that is the straight edges that generate these surfaces. So all of these straight edges that belong to these openings that are into the galleries are partaking and generating geometrically the surfaces. This also becomes a site, this site with light of this particular kind for particular kinds of artistic uh, site-specific interventions. Um, and uh, finally, of course, owing to the way in which seasons and daylight are changing, we have a very particular kind of installation piece of light itself in the building because it's, it's always varying and exciting to see it depending on whether on the rare occasion uh, it's overcast or it's evening, which is of course every day. Um, it's a changed environment relative to others. One of the most compelling things about it is the color of light that it brings into the building. It's a fundamentally different color always and in introducing that in otherwise the homogeneous color uh, coloration that the rest of the building has. Um, here you see the levels and the distortion and section that's caused by these levels, which are connected by ramps. So the, the, the movement of light and the movement of the section, the density that required it, all of this is correspondingly in this kind of, uh, let's just say, reciprocity of causality that I've tried to describe because you could begin this narrative either by arguing that the square rectangularity of galleries in the context of this site uh, was the driver. But finally, I have to tell you though that I've never begun a conversation about the building without telling everyone that 
of bringing light all the way to the bottom was the, the primary protagonist of that space. And indeed, it is the name of the, the book about the building, The Lightfall. Um, and it thereby and does something else very interesting in my mind, which is to reshape the whole museum as a cabinet of, 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 of galleries. Um, it's a very particular kind of, um, what should I say, um, mm, dioramic experience of, of museum space. And then something else happens, which is this is analogized by a, a kind of perambulatory movement that was very site specific tightness of the site requiring it, and the movement of the surfaces of the outside, which is identical to those that form the light fall, but that are, are horizontally, I'm sorry, vertically compressed on the exterior, uh, produce the same geometry, but now faceted and light is thereby serving to give evidence to the construction of the surface, the geometry of the surface on the outside. Doing the similar thing here, in a museum in Taiyuan, China with the faceting. A similar idea plays out on the interior, and I think here's an interesting comparison between this and Tel Aviv. Look at this image and then look at the Tel Aviv. You can see in Tel Aviv the coloration of light, the dark, not only light to dark, but also difference of warm to warm hues and cool hues is more definitive than here where too much light is introduced into a much larger uh, atrium required by the, the client. But that, that, and that this left us to have to introduce color in other ways, the greenhouse element, and only rely on the distinction of the darkness that you see on the left as opposed to the light it's a less compelling de deployment of light because of the overlit nature and scale, the lack of density there not giving us this, uh, this capacity to use light that way. Project that Carlos mentioned in New York, which is very interesting because it's lodged in a very narrow site, something that has interested me for a long time, dealing with very, uh, let's say, uh, attenuated sites. You think, again, about the flat dish, but now a vertical one. Uh, and this flat space, this very compact space, crushes uh, what would be a more uh, extended canopy, let's say metaphorically, squeezes it. And this, interestingly, was motivated the putting of a roof over this space, not so much only to keep rain out of it, but it was discussed from the beginning that the idea of putting a cover here would make the space lighter, at least insofar as if we could, if we could let reflection increase the presence of light in a particular way and create the sense of a provisional enclosure that, has, that is lit with intention to create a certain kind of interiorized atmosphere. It would be attractive to the public in a way that an entirely open, um, alley would not in this part of New York. Very near ground zero, this is the Goldman Sachs headquarters, a new headquarters on the right, and the hotel, Conrad Hotel on the left. This becomes reduced to its essential form, which are these, these lineaments, and reconstructed as faceted planes again on a giant scale version of the Tel Aviv facade of faceted planes. This is summed up in just, th this hyperboloid is summed up in only three triangles. Very strategic three triangles that give that form to it. Um, and you will see that the behavior of those with light varies to in ways that will inscribe the presence of those planes in, in different ways. Sometimes some of those planes nearly disappear, or they unify into a complex, you know, into kind of a complicated uh, com uh, reflectivity that makes indiscernible the difference between the, the inside and the extended outside to interiorize the space. As you see here, the facades in the distance are not so different than they appear inside, so that this is a kind of room at this point. Very different idea 
And it's owing to the double layering of glass, which is unusual here, we have glass above and below the structure. Normally it would be one or the other on a canopy of this type. That was probably the most radical thing about this project, that it's clad on both, it's a sandwich. Um, but you can see how light has also done something else here with reflection, which is to produce, well, the double. And the double um, introduced a kind of rotation um, axially, if you could imagine, kind of Y or X axis through this in an orbital kind of effect. It's not so unlike the light fall, but a horizontal version of it, where the facades of the adjacent buildings partake in constructing that. There are other, of course, conditions of doubling that are just in the nature of things happening. And they're quite effective here because of the plan of the space, which is bent and allows you to see these doubles in ways you normally wouldn't. And the disagreements of the geometries caused by the bend makes an element like that break out and double itself and so forth. Um, light here does something really compelling in this project in Michigan. I feel because it would seem that the skewing of the plan of it's a rather voluntary move to create a kind of perspectival entry between the new building and the original and so forth, which it does. No doubt that's a motive for doing that, but a more compelling motive in the context of this conversation, and for me really, was that by lighting the building the way we have, top lighting it and this sawtooth we end up forcing this wing into a position whereby it's facing due north. We're getting reflections on northern surfaces from the, from the roof. Initially, they were to have been clear story. The vertical planes of the sawtooth would have been the sources of light, but instead, I preferred to have it be reflected light. Um, because the coloration of light would be so differentiated thereby, uh, therefore, relative to the other building. This obsession with color I've had for quite some time, I think will give this edition a very different character than the relentless, uh, the, what should I say, the relentless fluorescent color of the other building. So you will enter into this natural hue of light. And that is owing to the re use of reflective as opposed to direct northern light. So all of those northern surfaces, right, become the source of southern light. Um, that, of course, does its magic <laughs> in mixing the yellow hue and the, and the blue again. Um, in this atrium. Here you see that. Now, interestingly enough, the angle of these planes in the sawtooth turns out to be two degrees, well, I think it was a degree and a half. This is an amazing coincidence. Off of the wall in my office here in Cambridge, which is was kind of the experiment in the old Frank Lloyd Wrightian tradition. You know, this, this skylight, we were building it this new skyline introducing those new steel beams there to pull that ceiling back right while we were designing Michigan uh, and sort of looking at what it would mean to have the reflection on the wall um, and not have it ever reach anyone's desk um, directly. Uh, we, we finally did have to allow that it will hit the tips of some desks but we'll only do it in hours. We don't expect students to be present since they will have been up all night. Um, was, <laughs> so anyway, uh, the interference of natural light had to be kind of um, contended with. Uh, we're hoping blinds won't never, will never be introduced. Another thing that happens, um, you know, rather than the faceting that generates another uh, need for light, you know, let's say comes along with light that you have in Tel Aviv where, you know, the facets are are indexed by light. They here are m marked out by the pattern of brick, which imitates, if you will, what happens in the Tel Aviv facade by other means, flattening it um, necessarily. There it is, bad, low res image from live feed on the adjacent, on an adjacent building. Um, and the inside finally happening 
uh, last project very briefly, a science center, really big building, 600,000 square foot science center on the lower left um, there in Hefei in China. This building, now we're in a different situation. We wanted to sort of test the question in another way. If we're not in the density. We're back in the Taiyuan situation we had been in, in in that museum. But now with an atrium that would be occupied by a planetarium and will uh, deal with light in an, an another way introduce light, that is by controlling it ourselves with the envelope. The envelope will be the means to, um, let's say, create the effects that density does in lieu of density to, to bring about some of those effects. So we have done what so many architects have done, which is to introduce a gradient of porosity in the surface. This orb rotating around in the building, imagine it's a ball that's moving all the way around. <laughs> it just happens to pause here uh, and make the atrium on the edge as opposed to the center of the building. Uh, and by virtue of the gradient, um, which is here built with um, both with um, panels, they are perforated uh, panels in front of a curtain wall, but then we have other, it transitions into frit. Um, so we, we transition the red as the, the frit. Um, and it has another gradient, a different one for different functions. Anyhow, uh, it's an interesting alternative approach that, uh, well, one way or another, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, there you can see the base of the planetarium under construction, this, this thing. Sorry. Ugh, I can't get it. All right, well, anyway. And the beginning of the envelope under construction. Um, one of the better qualities of construction we've experienced in China. Maybe the best, actually, this. Um, okay, so I just wanted to end with the thought, um, Charles, that um, Corbusier might have had about this conference. I think he would have said this. <laughs> um, it, finally, the word morphic is, I think, not so suggestive that the question is only about carving, shaping, or determining the form of the total building according to um, the necessities brought about through the environmental issue. I think it's no doubt going to have to deal with the question of beauty. Um, we know well that he thought so. This was the, the side of Corbusier that was then involved passion, um, not the size, side of Corbusier that involved causality. Anyway, so much for causes and beauty. Um, thank you for indulging me for the, these few minutes. <laughs> <laughs>